Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer, and welcome to Welcome to the Wasteland, my weekly show where I take a deep dive into a particular film, and guess what? It's still John Ford, <laughs> and we're getting into 1938 with Four Men and a Prayer, and joining me yet again for this episode is my wife, Jess. Jess, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. And before we get into our feature film, for those who haven't tuned into the show before, we have three segments, leading off with our coming attractions for... The extended Valentine's release week of February 16th, and then we get into our feature film and have some recommendations for you. But let's get things started with our coming attractions. Yes, we do have some releases on Valentine's Day in the middle of the week before this episode comes out, Madam Web, and you have... The Bob Marley One Love film, which Bob Marley films getting horrible reviews so far, and Madam Webb's embargo lifts literally the morning of the opening night. Oh. So not great. Ah. But I know one film that was interesting, Jess, is Bleeding Love, starring Ewan McGregor. What interests you about that film? Mostly just the Ewan McGregor part. Yes, Ewan McGregor is indeed in this film, and it is coming out like the he seems weekend. seems like a nice gentleman. Yep, it's coming out the weekend proper. So, a young couple come across a bag of drug money and leave town, but are... Love oh, life's bleeding. It moved on me. <laughs> Which, yes, that's definitely one I'm excited about, love because... Love bleeding? Yeah. I was going to say, wasn't that pretty good? That's the one with uh, Kristen Stewart and oh. that new A24 film. Oh. No, so a father takes his estranged daughter on a road trip in an effort to get her out of trouble, and this is indeed starring Ewan McGregor and Clara McGregor. So... Oh, his actual daughter, yes, I assume. Wow. Yes, so actual father-daughter journey here. So hmm. get some father-daughter time out in the middle of nowhere. Now, the film that I was most looking forward to this weekend, and this is 100% also because of one actor in the movie, <laughs> is uh, Land of Bad, and it's because it's Russell Crowe. Mm. Um, this, this wasn't a strong weekend for releases, to be perfectly honest, but when I saw the trailer for this, I'm like, Liam Hemsworth, gross. But then Russell Crowe was in it, I'm like, yes. So, we did watch this one already, but um, I just like seeing Russell Crowe in things, and he has another film coming out in March, which I'll be excited for that one as well. But from based on watching it, all the best parts of the movie are Russell Crowe's parts. So, not surprised. So, mm -hmm. this is something worth checking out, and especially like an awkward and weird kind of Valentine's extended week of releases. Um, why is Madam Web coming out on Valentine's? I guess they're like, hey, it worked for Deadpool. Ladies? Question mark? Well, it's supposed to be counter-programming. And I guess, yeah, because it's all uh, women's spider women and Madam Web, and nobody <laughs> nobody cares about this movie. Uh, so nobody cares well, about you know, this movie. Well, you know, female spiders are bigger and stronger than male spiders, so... Maybe it's a film well, about to, feminine to, empowerment. Well, I think it's exactly what it's supposed to be, but doesn't look good at all or interesting at all, and it's a shame. Yeah. But, you know, Sony's trying to be like, hey, look, we're going to release three villain movies this this year, and it's just like, why is Madam Web getting a movie, and why is Madam Web not an old woman? Those are my big questions. Yeah, Madam makes me think of older women, not like... Not um, Dakota Johnson? Yeah, no. So, oh well, okay. it's happening, whatever. Um, it. It's not a strong week, and I'm really hoping Lisa Frankenstein makes some money as we're recording this, because the box office looks like crap as mm -hmm. of right now, after Argyle just completely tanked mm -hmm. at the box office. It's really looking like, like, and the Coen Brothers, like Joel Cohen's film coming out, Driveway... Dolls is not exactly something that screams big box office mm. hit either. So it was fun though. Nobody, we yeah, <laughs> and we both highly recommend seeing it. But when it really comes down to it, I guess you know we're all just waiting for Dune, <laughs> the first weekend of March. But we'll that get would be there. A great Valentine's Day release. What Dune? Dune specifically one aspect of the release that I won't mention because Shane won't like it. I'm just saying. 
Now I gotta double check Jess isn't on the episode for Dune coming attraction, so I don't have to talk about that again. But getting into our feature film, this is Four Men in a Prayer, and this is a another John Ford release. This one from 1938. We're almost at the 1940s, which then becomes a whole bunch of war films, mm. uh, war documentaries <laughs> that John Ford did. But at least we get some heavy hitters coming up in the next couple weeks. But this one starring Loretta Young, George Sanders, David Niven. So some pretty big name actors. And there was no other information that I found on Wikipedia <laughs> about any of the production or anything mm. of this hour and 25 minute film. And the only thing I saw is it came out to mixed reviews. Mm. But Jess, what are your thoughts on Four Men and a Prayer? I'm going to forget about it probably by the end of today. That's a glowing recommendation <laughs> from Jess. This it's... story about four sons coming together when their father is court-martialed from the British military. And it seems like he killed himself. And they're like, no, he didn't. And we're going to find out why. Mm. Both in India and Buenos Aires. Yeah, they're in all those different places. So. In an hour and 25 minutes. I always cringe when I see India in John Ford films. Because it's not great. He doesn't have a good track record. And yes, there's... It was like, oh, it came up on the title card or whatever, and I was like, oh, no. So, let's get this all out of the way. When was this movie racist? Um, right the, off the bat. I'm there's scene... Well, technically, no. Okay. Because the only people they showed in India the first time they showed India were all the white soldiers at a court-martialing mm. hearing. But then we went back to India, and there's definitely actors who are 100% not Indian, all acting like savages and trying to kill people. Mm. Good luck. Great. It sure was the 30s. And then we jump ship to... Down to Buenos Aires, and there's definitely actors who are not... Uh, Latino actors playing Latino characters. Um, so that's not great either. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's one Asian character that there's this really weird di mm -hmm. dynamic between David Niven and him with like this just like nonsense talk yeah that was really weird right. and i'm like why is this even in the movie yeah the whole movie was totally just all over the place it's like here's a violent massacre of hundreds of people yes and, uh, slide whistle they didn't really use a slide whistle but no this wasn't live well and let have. die bad having a slide whistle during an which let's be real here that stunt and live and let die from uh no that's not live and let man with the golden gun I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. No, it's Live and Let Die. Live and Let Die, they do this incredible stunt. Or, no, it might have been. All I know is it has a that really. It really has that crazy, over the top southern, uh, like, detective character in it, and those are the two he's in. They have this amazing stunt, and it's incredible. They actually flip a car over a river on a broken bridge, twirling it through the air, and they put a slide whistle in. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. And just like, what? Why? What? Yeah, same energy. What? So, yes, this movie has horrible tonal issues, like, from start to finish. This because was very special. Like, there was anything special about it. There, there's fleeting moments of some good camera pans and, like, the... I think some of the well-shot scenes are, like, the opening scene with that very brief court-martialing scene. Mm -hmm. There's some nice camera movements and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, that's well-shot. Mm -hmm. There's one scene later in the film where there's a gun involved that the our like our protagonists don't know about and like okay mm -hmm. that's some hitchcock like oh my god is something bad gonna happen it doesn't quite reach like hitchcock level of tension uh but you know it has some of that bit there and then like when there is action or let me let me refrain that when there's violence it's well shot, it's captured, like there's a bar brawl, and then there's just a straight massacre of people. But the issue is, in the bar brawl, there's a guy like, Co -co -do -do -do! Yeah, in the middle of it, I'm like, am I supposed to feel threatened for yeah. these characters, or am I supposed to be listening to the chicken man over here? I felt like a baby watching my parents fight for the first time. And, and then like, got ah. shot. And like, it should be like a big dramatic moment, but he was just cock a doo doo <laughs> right before it, I'm just like, Okay. We, we excuse that in True Grit because it's well, <laughs> a story well told. Yeah, and then you have 
like, silly romantic banter, which there's a whole romantic subplot in this that just feels you don't like... Need it. Like, the, the female character that Loretta Young plays plays an important part in the narrative, but every time it tries to do, like, oh, fun little, like, <laughs> romantic kind of banter... It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit because then the next scene you see a horrible massacre yeah, of a bunch of people. Would you guys like to solve my father's murder and go on a nice, light-hearted, romantic romp around the world? And there's a big conspiracy going on in this film. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Not quite like the beekeeper get bigger to like, oh my god, the president's involved. Oh my god. Spoilers. Spoilers for the beekeeper. Um, but like this movie, it just keeps escalating. But then the, it feels like it's dragging out. Like, this is an hour and 25 minute film. The third act of this should have felt tighter oh and more my god, intense. It was so long. And it just kept going. It's just like, you could have got to the point at some point, and you just did it. And it just dragged. It felt awkward, and you're just like, by the end... Who cares? Like... For me? They really spent... Do. Like, because this is only an hour and 25 minutes. They introduced these four young men in a montage. Pretty sure only reason two of them really stand out to me, because it's David Niven and it's George Sanders. So, like... Oh, yeah. If it's only because they're famous actors, that's not a great sign. And it just, you know, one of the young... Uh, brothers, uh, Jeffrey, who's the one who's falling in love with this woman. He's such a turd about it. <laughs> He's like, oh, woman, get out of here. And she's like, Thanks. well, I could get you on this ship. He's like, what are you waiting for? I'm like, wow, guy, that's real nice. Dames. It's just, this whole entire film is just all over the place. It has like this Literally big... Literally and figuratively. Yeah. So like, I think it's fine in the scheme of John Ford films I've watched so far because mm -hmm. it's not horribly racist it's only like <laughs> mildly bar, racist it's the bar we've set for these and so it's like it only aged mostly poorly in some points poorly like not the whole entire film it would be meant in any era and then like it has some strong performers in it it has mm. some tense moments and some little bits of flair, f like, real good filmmaking. But, like, in the end, it just kind of feels like a throwaway. And the fact that, like, this is only an hour and 25 minutes, it just feels like, oh, he probably had bigger movies he was mm -hmm. working on. You know, like, mm -hmm. Stagecoach coming up very soon kind of thing. It's just like, oh, uh, okay, well... In the end, this wasn't John Ford's strongest effort, and it was a very mixed bag of a movie. Any thought, other thoughts, Jess? No. Well, time for recommendations, and I forgot to ask Jess what she wanted yeah, to recommend. I was like, oh, so God. I'm gonna give mine first while she thinks well, about something. Bold of you to think. So my first recommendation, new film, was Cobweb, that we actually watched this past Friday. It is a Korean film. It's a period piece. Oh yeah, I like. The it's like a metafiction about a filmmaker having these visions about making a film and then the film coming to fruition and all the chaos on set. And you get to see the film within the film, which is a really intense, big, melodramatic, black-and-white kind of thriller. Mm. And uh, Sung Kang-ho, who is very famous for being in all the Bong Joon-ho films, he's fantastic as I said Korean Johnny Depp and just said Korean Pedro Pascal, and then realizing... All three of them have similar glasses and goatees. Yeah. So, <laughs> kind yeah, of like that, probably ki what that kind think. of look to it. He gives a great performance, and there's definitely a lot of tension. It's it's a little too bold at times, and a tr like there's a couple times it's like really big swings, but it's a really interesting film, and I thought it was really well done, and definitely like captured the time period, really gives that feel of like oh, I love a good movie about making movies. This definitely nailed that and scratched that itch. My number two, which was a rewatch off of my watch list because I haven't bought this one yet, is The Red Shoes, which I rewatched last night. And this is one of the most beautiful looking films. And there's a whole entire sequence where they actually show the production of The Red Shoes that they're working on the film because this film is a film about making 
a stage opera, mm. a ballet specifically. And the actual ballet sequence in this film is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen put in a movie. Because um, Pressburger and... Why am I blanking? Uh, the, two, the two directors of this film are absolutely incredible. Their film, Black Narcissus, is one of my favorite films. It's just Powell and Pressburger. The two of them have created some of the most beautiful films ever put on film. And not only does it, like, the sequence in it with the actual ballet look absolutely incredible, but it's a very interesting and bold mm, modern reimagining of a fairy tale. So, like, not only is the ballet in the film the fairy tale that they're turning into a ballet, but the film itself is an allegory based off of the a uh, fairy tale, The mm -hmm. Red Shoes. Mm -hmm. So even, like, the greater story of the film pulls from, like, the themes and ideas from that as well. And it's tragic, like a lot of their films are, but it's definitely something worth watching. And my last one, which was a rewatch of one of my own films, By which time. I have... Well, I usually do three recommendations if I've watched a new film, a watchlist film, and want to mm -hmm. free watch my own films. Is Barton Fink, which I will be on the episode of And Also podcast with my buddies Ro uh, Robert Buffard and Foster Harlfinger to talk about this film. This is the Coen bro I think the Coen Brothers' best hidden gem that they have. John Turturro gets an opportunity to really sink his teeth into a leading role, which he never gets to do generally. And John Goodman is so fantastic. And Michael Lerner, who plays the studio head at Capital Pitches, <laughs> is so good. And this film is a very interesting representation of writer's block. It's an interesting representation on the corporatization of art. Mm. It also is an interesting look at that great divide of classism between intellectuals and creators in that, like, what most people today would call that elitist mm. level of society versus, like, the everyman, because that's what Barton Fink thinks that he understands, but has never once spent any time in the lives of the every man and when he does he doesn't listen and it's such an interesting journey through that and it's also deacon's first film with the cohen's and it's just gorgeous jess what do you, would you like to recommend um i can't remember the rules or the parameters so i'm gonna recommend getting silly stickers to put on your car okay and magnets because i got one um that makes me smile every time and even if i'm going to work it buys me like Two seconds of joy before I realize I have to go to work. What is the silly sticker that you? Oh were... man, sticker or bumper? I have a I have a magnet because I have commitment problems and anxiety, and mm -hmm. I've always had it as a child and can't do stickers. So well, I do, but I put them in a case. Well, which ones do you have that you really like that you'd like to recommend to uh, people? Well, I have one that says, um, "I really want to find Don't Honk at Me, My Dad Is Dead." But I can't find it as a magnet. I'll keep looking. But I really like my True Patriots Break for America's Only Native Marsupial. And it's got a possum with a hat. Nice. An American flag background. Very nice. And things are on fire, if I remember correctly. I'm pretty sure if you have like the right picture, you could go to Vista Print. They can turn it into a magnet. Yeah, I, I'm trying to decide like how committed I want to be to this idea. But... Definitely okay. sounds very just. I ordered some more, so we'll see. They're going to be a surprise to Shane. Well, so thank you for the very interesting recommendation <laughs> to pimp out your car. Make yeah, it very make you. It, make it fun because, oh, my, the other one is um, Please Be Patient, I'm Nine. It's a good one, too. I like that one. Interesting. <laughs> but you're not. Um, That's the but funny part. Those are our recommendations, not including... <laughs> Um, for men and a prayer, and also the coming attractions, which not a whole lot to recommend this week either. But Sorry. Jess, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. And thank all of you out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland Reviewer. <laughs>